Welcome everyone. You've reached Sanctuary's Coffee and Conversation. My name is Myrna Haskell. I'm executive editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online publication for women with a focus on women in the arts, women humanitarians, educators, and business leaders who make a difference in their local or global communities, women's health and wellness, and a variety of topics in inspirational travel, career, and finance. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Sherry Kelly. She is a clinical psychologist, an inspirational speaker, and also an executive coach. Good morning, Sherry, how are Hi you? Hi there. Hi, it's so great to be here. It's so great to see you. This is fabulous. I just wanna give our listeners a little bit of a backstory about us. So I have known Sherry for years because I used to interview her for feature pieces I was doing for other publications. So we've known each other for a long time. And then once I've launched Sanctuary, she was actually an expert for our Ask an Expert section, which is an yeah. interactive section of the publication. And currently in our September issue, she has a feature in our health section where she teaches us how to stay positive through the storms of life. So listeners can find that directly from our homepage if you'd like to take a look at her article. But anyway, what we're going to be discussing today is brain health and how to keep our, our brains young as we age. And I just think that this is such an important topic, Sherry, because my grandmother had Alzheimer's disease. I know a lot of our listeners mm -hmm. have seen their parents and their grandparents suffer and do the journey of dementia and the decline from that. And it's very sad. And it makes us all worried about what's going to happen to us, you know, as we age and if our brains are going to remain, you know, healthy. So my first question for you is, how does modern life impact our brains? That's a great question. Uh, modern life is impacting our brains because our, our brains and our bodies are now going through life and acting in a very different way than it was intended to function through bioevolution progress. So that means that we are now engaged in behaviors that we were not meant to be engaged in. Now, we have moved really from, for the first time, I believe, in history from being proactive beings to being reactive beings. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So our bioevolution has been progressed and has been developed over tens of thousands of years for survival, right? Mm -hmm. The main... The main reason we have a brain is for our survival, okay? That's right. Not, not, for, not for entertainment or shopping. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love that. Okay. So what's happened in modern life is that we are no longer using our brains for survival or to move forward, that we're actually reactive more than being proactive. We, we are reacting to stimuli. We're reacting to technology. We've become very passive. Oh. Physically and mentally. That's a big difference then. It is a big difference. So when you think about how we lived in society 100 years ago um, compared to now, and especially for those in the non-Western worlds where technology has catapulted them into modernity at such a high rate, they've really gone from being very proactive people who you know, had to work very hard to keep themselves fed, to keep their caloric intake in survival mode, to mm -hmm. um, keeping themselves safe and warm into a, a life behind a screen. Yeah. So is that making sense? That's yeah. Just, it's is, kind of scary though. It when is. You think, so when you, yeah. It, it is. So that's why I think it's interesting to take a step back and look at it from a bioevolutionary perspective. Oh, definitely. Uh, so what about specifically, what about um, digital technology and social media? Does that influence aging at all? I think it does. I mean, it's hard because we don't have a lot of the longitudinal studies to show the impact, but we can 
look at usage and we can look at how the brain reacts to it. So if we just look at usage before COVID, let's say, um, the average time a young person was spending on social media was about four hours a day. So that averages to be more than one day a week. Which was already media. a lot, right? I right. mean, that was already too much. <laughs> right. That's and now with, with COVID, you can see that this has now at least doubled to be either on social media or on the internet. For, for adults, this is interesting okay. because we are more connected digitally mm -hmm. than ever before, but we are less connected and feel less connected and we feel more isolated and lonely than ever before. So there's research being done on baby boomers usage of media, not just social media, but all media. Mm -hmm. So last year, this is before COVID, um, over, I want to say over 5,000 boomers were, uh, interviewed and they looked at their usage patterns. Okay. We're not watching TV. We're not watching TV. We are, the majority of us are interacting with and getting our entertainment from YouTube videos, Netflix, mm -hmm. Hulu. Changed. Mm -hmm. Internet stream. It's totally changed. Totally changed. So media companies are scrambling because they don't have us as a captive audience anymore. You know, it's right. not just the younger generation that is using, you know, media outlets such as, you know, Netflix. Right. It's They're all using it. Also. And Hulu and those things. Yes. And this is a very interesting dynamic. And when we look at just the demographics in 10 years from now, 2030, the vast majority of boomers are actually going to be around 75. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Does that make sense? Yes. So almost all of us are going to be over um, 70. Right. Okay. And a large chunk of the baby boomer generation is going to be 75 and okay. older in 10 years. Okay. So, Media companies are scrambling to try to figure out, well, are, how can we capture that audience? Are they, right. you know, we anticipate, how are we going to get them to consume? You know, so this is, it's, it's an interesting shift. So that's another way how digital technology has influenced our behaviors. Yeah, and I wanted to just pick up on a little something you said. So you mentioned COVID, and you said that there's all of, we're getting all of this stimulation. Everybody's on these Zoom meetings and everything now, right? But I, I feel that too. I'm a hugger. <laughs> so um, the, the lack of like just real in-person, one-on-one um, interaction, and for me and for my business even too, I do so well when I can get out in the community and talk to people and show my passion oh, for the magazine and say hello and absolutely. help someone. It's terrible, yeah. really. It's uh -huh. really terrible. And, you know, it's really hard for us. I'm just going to go back to our demographic because even before COVID, one of the major um, challenges that people over the age of 45 experience is, is loneliness. And there was actually a, a study called by Great Call, and this is like over a thousand uh, boomers. Um, Forty-three percent last year said they were experiencing loneliness. That was before COVID. A lot. Okay, a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, a recent study was published in the UK, and I just wanted to tell you this: um, it, it's fascinating. They they did a meta analysis of studies from many many different countries. And they found that the peak age for loneliness um, was 49. Wow. Yeah. That's not, that, it surprises and, me, and I that, guess. And that along with that, the peak age of depressive symptoms was 49. Well, yeah, right? Because they, there's a correlation there. I guess. Yes. Right? Loneliness, depression mm. changes, your life changes. Maybe your kids are grown. 
work might be changing. You feel like you're approaching 50. It's that midlife crisis for us. Yeah, and you know, I would have thought, I think, though, just as a layman, Sherry, I would have thought that it would be more, it would be an older age, you know, people no, who, and, who have lost houses, et cetera. Yeah, I know, but here's the good news. <laughs> okay. I have something to look forward to. Good. <laughs> I actually, um, older people actually adjusted better. They were able to put things more in perspective. Wow. Okay. Okay. And so I think there va there's a, a bit of a value shift to explore as you get older and what your, your expectations are different. So okay, a lot, okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the dissatisfaction at 49 in my opinion that you're seeing at 49 in these studies has to do with the discrepancy between your expectations for life versus how life is behaving. Okay. Okay. I get it. I get it. You know, so we're mentioning this age thing. Yes. So I'm a, I'm a midlifer, you know, many of our readers and listeners are in midlife. So my next question is, um, so what can we do in midlife actually and beyond to keep our brains, you know, strong, to protect them, to keep them healthy? What are some tips and advice you have for us? Well, okay. So, um, so the research really shows that, you know, that the practicality of exercise is actually very true um, to stay active, to stay physically active, to get your endorphins going, okay. um, heart rate going, high heart rate exercise, such as walking fast, mm -hmm. um, walking to a beat. There's actually a study that looked at different types of music and they found that um, the beat that is typically found in some disco music like ABBA. Oh yeah, beat, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that that kind of a beat, um, it helps us stay at a rate which is really um, optimal. And you know, yeah, so you know, the, you know, you see, it's not just about oh, lifting weights. It's about keeping the blood flow, keep going, keep moving, and you know, do something every day. Whether it's you know taking a 20 to 30 minute walk every day. It's that simple. That's really going to give you big benefits, even though it's a small thing that you can do. I love that. And I love that walking because, you know, that, that's something we can do for forever, right? So even if we, yeah. our knees are kind of getting bad and, you know, it's low impact, right? But you're it's still getting impact. everything. You're and still then getting the, other, the blood flow. Yeah. And then the other big factor that's been studied now for decades is the important role of social support in longevity and health. I've heard so, that. You know, keeping connected. So I have an easy to remember um, mnemonic and acronym for staying healthy. It's called MAKE, like make it happen. M -A -K -E. Oh, I like it. Okay. And the M stands for, and you should have MAKE in your day. Every day, should, you should have MAKE a part of your life. M is for mindfulness, you know, tuning into what your needs are, turning in, into your emotions, um, and mindset, having a growth mindset, even in midlife and an older age, to keep flexible up here, yeah. too, that it's not forever, this is not all or nothing, that we can learn from mistakes. The A is um, activate or take action. So don't just be passive, do something with your life get involved, exercise, maybe um, do something that has a social impact in your life, um, do something that's maybe volunteer work. So some, take some kind of action. K is keeping connected. Oh, I like that. Go the yes. social support. Yes. Keep connected. Be with other people. Talk to other people. And the E is that energy and exercise. Keep, you know, keeping fit keeping your energy up, keeping your energy up, level up. So that's make every day you should have part of that in your life. You can actually com combine some of these things, right? Yeah. So you can like, keep, you can, you can walk with a friend, right? You're yes, saying walk connected. with a friend. Do, yeah. Do, do mindfulness, meditation, and exercise. You can meditate while you walk. Focus on your breathing. You now think about your mindset. Music is another M as part of the make. So, you know, listening to music and keeping that beat up mm -hmm. um, to help keep the heart rate up and keep your, your legs in gear and get, make, get those steps in gear. Oh, so music that's is, make. Music is a true healer, isn't it? 
It is. It it music is. is great. Let me ask you this little follow-up on this, though. So I've read things that talk about, you know, because people know, oh, you should keep doing crossword puzzles, or you should do this, or you should do that. I read something that says, do something new. So say, so I'm a writer and editor, right? So mm -hmm. I might continue to do this for years and years, but what's going to really stimulate my brain is learning new things that I'm not used to. Is Do you know anything about, you know, that yes, area at all? It's, um, it's really exploring the novel content. And so you're you're learning new things. You're exposing yourself to new people. As a writer and an editor, you already have that built into your profession yeah. and into your passion so it, it's constantly trying to get something new and novel and not do the same thing every day so many people i know that are retired fall into a routine and that's not healthy for you because your brain becomes complacent okay okay, okay. so yeah. not only does your body become lazy but the brain in a sense becomes complacent and the brain has evolved to actually want and search for novel stimuli. So you want to, quote, feed your brain yes. with novel stimuli and keep it going. Makes total sense, total sense. And, and just to circle back to what I was talking mm -hmm. about technology, because here's the punchline, which is scary. So when we spend too much time on the internet or on social media, what that is doing is actually slowing down our brains. Our brain accommodates for that stimulation, for the uh, visual and auditory stimulation, especially mm -hmm. in certain games that you might be playing and especially on social media, mm -hmm. so that your brain becomes, is actually slowing down to accommodate. It doesn't have to work so hard on its own because it's getting stimulation. Your brain kind of becomes, I think, lazy, sort of sits back. Okay, entertain me now, entertain me, instead of the brain being a seeker. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. And the other thing that I don't like about with, with social media and the brain is that a lot of the platforms are forced choice platforms, like Tinder. And some neuroscientists <sighs> actually call this cognitive Tinderization. Wow. Oh, I hadn't heard okay. that before. Okay. So you're swiping left and right, left and right. And that is forcing you to make a choice mm -hmm. instead of actively thinking about something and planning and being a critical thinker. You're just reacting. Yeah. And of course, a lot of platforms like that because it, they're consumerist oriented in many times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, swipe, no, I, swipe the you swipe like. thing. Yeah. And then if, you, if you have grandkids, you'll see the babies are swiping, right? It's almost like hypnotic. It is. Right. And your brain, and it's, it, it affects the speed at which the neurotransmission is firing in the brain with many of the platforms, not all, but many. So be mindful of the kind of platform that you're spending a lot of time on and disengage from it and get in the real world. So as much, you know, it's hard right now, but as much as you can read a real book, not just a Kindle book. Okay. I, I know. Well, we, I love holding a book. Are you the same I do way? Too. I do too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you and I, and most of the viewers here have that luxury of knowing what life was like before digital technology. Right. That's right. But, you know, Gen Z and our grandkids, they don't know that. That's right. You know, they don't have that, you know, um, sense of holding a book or going to the library. So as much as you can do in the real world, not in the virtual world, is going to keep you healthy. Okay, I get it. So let me ask you this, though. So does, does healthy aging look the same today as it did for our parents, or is there a difference there? What I think that? it's really interesting. That's a great question, and it's different. Because okay. if we look at what, if we look at our parents at age 60, they probably in your mind's eye seem a lot older at 60 than we do. Right. Yes, right? absolutely. Each generation and almost. Each seems. generation. But in some ways, I think they're different. They were more proactive than we were. You know, mm -hmm. we, they didn't, they weren't spending all this amount of time on the computer or in front of a TV. Um, they were very social. They you know, if they were lucky, they had friends, they played cards, mm -hmm. or they went to religious services. 
they you know went to concerts or they enjoyed music or they enjoyed dancing um but our expectations for um I, I call it legacy living, not senior living, <laughs> legacy living. Our expectations like um, are very different. And, you know, I, I consult with some organizations that um, make uh, recreational activities and, and um, what I'm going to call assisted living and senior living type of uh, programming. And uh, what we're seeing with the older crowd of 80 plus is very different. They, they don't want to sit home or they don't want to go to a retirement community and be stuck there. They, they want to do more traveling. And this, again, this was before COVID, but they want to do more traveling. They want to do more education. They want to have a, a broader social reach than just one retirement community. They don't mm -hmm. want to be sitting in the same chair or just playing golf um, right. or just playing cards. They, they are going to expect more of themselves than what our parents expected of themselves as we approach 80. Okay. All right. Well, that, I, I can see that. I can visualize that. Yeah. Yes. So, so that's, so, so there's some good things going on here too, though, right? Should we just, um, should we make sure we're limiting ourselves to a certain extent from the technology then? Is there sort of a sweet spot for how long we should be well, on? I, you know, I think what an interesting exercise for people to do is it's on your iPhone. If you have an iPhone, mm -hmm. um, or on your computer, you can actually track how many hours you spend on your device. Okay. Good idea. Yeah. And yes. that might be surprising to you. That's the first step is okay. to recognize how many hours a day you're spending online. And it will shock online. a lot of people probably, right? It will shock a lot of people. And then you, step two, add that up for the week. And then, yeah, and the month. <laughs> then it starts getting really scary. I mean, yeah. whether or not you like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, you're handing them a significant portion of your life every year. Yeah. Do you really, I mean, that's okay if you're all right with the bargain. Right. But do you really want to be spending four days a month on a social media platform that's actually meant to be consumerist in nature to get you to buy stuff or you're the product. Do you know that you're the product? Yeah. They're watching you. They're that's selling your they're selling your information. They're watching your behavior online, whether you know it or not. They're tracking what you're clicking on or what you're scrolling to or what websites you're landing on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do you really want to be someone's product? So that's right. why I say take ownership of your behavior online. Okay. Perfect. Well, I think I'm going to ask you now, because I know a lot of listeners are, are hearing what you have to say and hearing how much knowledge you have. So yeah. do you want to just talk briefly about some of the services you offer sure. and then let listeners know how they can reach you? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Well, I am based in West Hartford um, in New York City and also sunny South Florida, where I'm talking with you today, from sunny okay. South Florida. Um, my main office is in West Hartford, Connecticut, in downtown West Hartford. Um, I do a lot of webinars. I do executive coaching online. I do virtual coaching all over the world. I love giving workshops and presentations. So when it's COVID safe, I can come in person. I love speaking at um, yoga centers. I love speaking with um, faith-based communities, uh, mm -hmm. senior centers, and um, schools. I do a lot of work with schools around the country. I have a website, mindandheartcoaching.com, mindandheartcoaching.com. And for those of you with grandkids, I also have a website, positiveteens.com, because I do a lot of work with parents and their teenagers. So I do uh, positive psychology coaching and executive coaching virtually to anywhere around the world. But if you want to come in person, I have um, an office also in, in Connecticut and also in New York. 
Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you. Well, and just to remind listeners again, you can also check out Sherry's um, article in our current issue. You can get that right from the homepage. So Sherry, thank you so much for joining us today. It's truly been thank a pleasure. I, I love been... seeing you today. At least we can see each other. Right? Oh, so this I, love, is good. I love your, I love your work. Love Sanctuary Magazine. Oh, and thank you. Love being, love being part of it. And my, uh, message at the end I always share is try to find a pebble of positivity in every situation. Oh, love it. Find a There's a post-it for our refrigerators. I love it, Sherry. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to end by wishing all of you good health, happiness, and continued inspiration. It's been a pleasure having you with us again today. Take care, mm -hmm. listeners and readers. Bye-bye. Thank you.